I remember when we first got to see actual gameplay footage of the new Zelda game, and how quickly I ran to Twitter to make the exact same joke everybody else was making, only worse. Good times. Why am I still on this website? The crafting mechanic does look kind of similar to Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, doesn't it? And you have this big world to explore with your homemade oven-baked vehicles. How similar is Tears of the Kingdom's vehicle crafting system to Banjo's? And what's the deal with Nuts and Bolts anyway? Wasn't that game terrible, like everyone on the internet will tell you whenever it's brought up? Over the course of this video, I will address these questions in chronological order, and I shall provide my verdict at the very- I love this game, okay? I flipping love this game! Woohoo! Nuts and Bolts fans, you Nice. All seven of you, come on, let's go! Now, people have covered this game and its flaws extensively, but for those not in the loop, Banjo-Kazooie was a short-lived 3D platforming series on the Nintendo 64 by Rare, a studio who used to work with Nintendo until they got purchased by Microsoft, and that's when things kinda went downhill. They're still known for classics like Donkey Kong Country, Conker's Bad Fur Day, and, well, Banjo-Kazooie. A game that surpassed even Mario 64 in some ways. Oh, is it getting hot in here, or is that the angry mob? It's the mob, isn't it? Continuing this from an undisclosed location, the Banjo games got a lot of praise for their colorful characters, silly jokes, and overall pretty dang good platforming. You play as a bear and a bird who abuse each other every two seconds. What's well, not the love? It's no surprise people lost their minds when they were brought back for Smash Brothers. People have been dying for a true Banjo 3E sequel, but all we got was a quickly forgotten semi-spin-off racing building kind of game. It wasn't a 3D platformer, it had cars, it made people furious. And uh, yeah. I like it. Are you surprised? You shouldn't be. I mean, I'm the schmongus who thought Bal and Wonderworld was okay. And to those who haven't clicked off the video yet and filed a restraining order against me in response to that statement, let me tell you what you all missed. This game is still a 3D platformer at heart. I mean, yeah, you do some Lovecraftian crafting, not unlike a Zelda. You hop into these levels to do missions, but do you know what you do for the vast majority of your playthrough? Getting from point A to point B while collecting Z by using a character with all kinds of wacky moves and gadgets. Is this starting to make more sense? That sounds more like a Zelda or a Mario Sunshine rather than a... Um... Lego Racers 2? Uh... I, I don't know, I'll fix this comparison in post. So yeah, I want to talk about this game's crafting system and why it makes it the most refreshing take on a 3D platformer slash exploration game that we've had in years. Picture this, a normal gaming scenario. Let's say there's a spot you want to go to because there's something shiny and we all have the brain of a magpie with ADHD. I do. In Nuts and Bolts, all you have is a jump, a swooshy swoosh Mario Galaxy attack, and that's it. But get this, your vehicle is an extension of you. It's not just there for you to create fresh roadkill, it plays an active role in overcoming platforming obstacles. A ledge is too high, put a big tray on your car, use it as a platform. Is a hill too steep? Change up your wheels, or build a helicopter, or freaking launch yourself and break all of Banjo's bones. There's so many options to break your spine, it's really quite fun. So how do you make vehicles that can do that? Is it anything like Zelda at all? Well, in Banjo you do have a bunch of physics objects in the overworld that you can manipulate to your will, but the vehicle parts are more like collectibles, and after you get them you can use them anytime you want. And you can access this vehicle editor anytime you want too, it's very easy to hop in and make some changes. Building a convertible of death feels a lot like Minecraft before Minecraft, because everything takes up cubes of space. Yes, it's a violation of the metric system, but at least it's not feet. Unlike in Zelda, you're not gluing stuff together, but it's still very much physics based. Everything needs to be in logical spots and things need to be connected to work. You got wheels, beals, whatever those are, kinda gives me spore vibes, but for vehicles. I think- shut up! I think the most time I spent in this garage was watching the silly animations on the side of the screen. Come on, you gotta admit that's charming. Just like in Zelda, the way you construct your vehicle has a huge impact on how it handles. I think people overlook this when they first played Nuts and Bolts, like, yeah, sometimes your car can feel weird, because a featherweight car with seven engines is probably not a good idea. You control how it handles, so don't forget to think about weight, power, placement of the wheels, fuel, it all matters. So to recap, Zelda probably gives you plenty to mess around with, and in fact, I think the limitations are what can make it fun. But Banjo will give you so many options without ever feeling intimidating, it's just plain fun to experiment and navigate these worlds with. And that's where the fun begins. Now overall this game is relatively slow paced and it takes some getting used to, but it gives you so many options. I had a blast trying to get collectibles early or to see if I could beat challenges in unexpected ways. I flippin' love this game, like the more you put into it the more you get out of it. For example, like you need to get rid of some big bricks, just blow them up. Or make a giant flying snowplow of death like I did. Uh, what else, like you need to climb to the top of a level, you can build a hybrid plane car. 
Then when you get there, you turn it into an armored boat to win a water race. As long as you accomplish your goal, the game gives you so much freedom to do it however you want. And if you're not that creative, it's fine. Like, the game cleverly gives you some examples to work with. You can unlock blueprints and mission-specific vehicles that you can mess with later. Collecting new vehicle parts feels very rewarding. Like, each new part doesn't just make your car cooler. It expands your movesets, puzzle solving, and, and combat abilities. When you get so many parts, like the big wheels and the wings and whatnot, like the focus in these levels shifts more to completing the challenges instead of getting where you want to go. And that's where this wonderfully crafted hub world comes in. Whenever you're here, you're only allowed to drive this little limited cart, so you have to get creative. And even then, I was able to get to all kinds of places, like by using the car as a platform, or by moving some fences to create a ladder. And the game is totally fine with you doing this, it only seems to encourage it. What I love about 3D platformers is that everybody takes a different path to the finish line, giving everybody a slightly different experience. And this game is no different. Though, in a regular 3D platformer, you can just, you know, walk up a hill. In nuts and bolts, however, something as simple as carrying jiggies to the town square can become a challenge of its own that requires precision and planning. This is me using precision and planning. Yeah, these physics can be a blessing and a curse, but whenever you mess up, it's pretty easy to get back on track. But yeah, we've talked about the gameplay, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Uh, graphics. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, while I like what it's going for with the more exaggerated shape language and all, overall it's just kind of inconsistent. Some characters had a glow up and their new designs feel like a fitting evolution, others are... Uh... Well... Um... I'd like to dunk them in spoiled boiling applesauce and they'd probably look better when I take them back out. The new looks are supposed to tie in with this craft's aesthetic, and they do look better in context. Everything is constructed, it has a charming artificial feel to it. It's different, but not bad. And the lighting, ooh. The way the different times of day create these wonderful distinct atmospheres, and the way the shadowy spots light up when you use your wrench, you will quickly forget that this is an early Xbox 360 title. The frame rate can be a bit iffy sometimes, but I heard it's better on the new Xbox, the one that I don't care enough about to remember its complicated naming system, I'm sorry. And I haven't even talked about the soundtrack, Ah, oh, it's so good! But I can't end this without talking about this game's issues. Who wants to end on a high note, right? Not every mission is fun, and the whole artificial fourth wall breaking direction it's going for, it just doesn't have the same charm the original games had. And the writing, uh, it's, it's hit or miss. Some jokes definitely got a chuckle out of me, don't get me wrong. Banjo, Kazooie, the rest of the gang, it's just wonderful to see them again and watch them interact with that silly, rare humor sauce. But because the game pokes fun at itself every time you breathe, and its characters can be borderline assholes to each other sometimes, the vibes are way off. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a little sad. Like, you can tell from the jokes that they knew not everyone was going to like this game, but... Even then, they stuck to their vision, and the game turned out fine. If it resonates with you, I would even say the game turned out flippin' awesome. But, because it wasn't a traditional 3D platformer, because it wasn't Banjo 3E, and because it had been 8 years since Banjo 2E, it didn't stand a chance. It didn't sell super poorly, but it's not even a third of what the first two Banjo games sold. I guess most people just weren't open to it. And you may think that I disagree with that sentiment, but no, I... I get it. I mean, come on, have you seen me? Of course I want a Banjo 3 just like you. Cartoony 3D platformers run through my veins. It's a medical condition, please do not make fun of it, I will cry. It has its flaws, it's not for everyone, and it was simply the wrong game at the wrong time. I can't blame people for wanting something else back then. But that's the thing. We're not getting Banjo 3E. And if we are getting it, it won't be what you're expecting it to be. Much of the original staff has left Rare at this point, and, and although we have been getting more platformers on the Xbox with games like Psychonauts 2, it's not exactly the biggest market for colorful games like Banjo. Even if they do make it and it turns out to be good, it's impossible to catch that exact same magic again that you felt when you first played the old games. So why not keep an eye open for new stuff? Something different, something that can give you new memories. This game won't fill that sequel-shaped, bear-shaped, bird-shaped hole in your heart, but it's a very original experience that you might just love. Like, take it from me, it's, it's not wise to let critics scare you away from something that looks interesting to you. And it's been 14 years! Is that long enough for people to stop mass dunking on something that is, at worst, mediocre? Guess I just gotta wait 12 more years before I can talk about Balan Wonderworld being just okay without getting a brick thrown through my window! Ha! Missed! Better luck next time, Mom! Hey, come on now, that's cheating. Anyway, I don't know how to end this. Uh... 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 Video games! <laughs>